Hi, my name is Eric Chinooka, and I'm a principal software developer at Cement. Today, we're going to talk about how Cement is boosting customer engagement with server-driven UI and Next.js. But first, let's talk about what Cement is and what we do. Cement is a digital engagement platform that uses behavioral science and data-driven insights to empower customers to self-serve and resolve past due bills before reaching collections. Cement currently serves the majority of top tier telecom providers in North America, as well as top North American financial institutions, or even expanding into utilities and media. <clears throat> Cement's platform offers many ways for customers to engage, and one way is through the use of landing pages. And that's what we're here to focus on during this talk. So what are landing pages? Well, Cement landing pages are standalone web pages that customers follow through on a call to action they might receive via an email or a text message. So what's the problem? Well, when we first started out, we were building it with MVC flows and layouts, which if you've ever used MVC, becomes hard to update when you wanna have unique content. Plus, since these layouts were shared, Changes to one client meant that changes happened to have happened to all clients. And during the onboarding process, we required heavy engineering involvement just to build the branded layouts. Finally, we had a new focus on TypeScript and React for front end experiences that we really wanted to leverage. So why did we pick Next.js? Well, we knew we wanted server side rendering but we knew we also had Netlify infrastructure. So we stumbled upon the next on Netlify package on uh, NPM, and it served all the purposes that we needed, where we got the benefits of Next <clears throat> and the serverless platform uh, using Netlify functions, which meant we got that added performance boost of being able to render at the edge. We also liked the developer experience on Next, especially the page-based routing, which we'll talk about later. And it's an active community. Lots of examples, lots of tutorials, and lots of help if, there, if you ever run into something that's unexpected. So what's the use case for server-driven UI? Well, Jamstack's core principles are pre-rendering and decoupling. Well, we've already decoupled it by serving the data through APIs, but we still needed uh, to get that content onto people's screens. And pre-rendering <clears throat> wasn't an option for us. We have too much customization using customer information into intertwined into the data of the page. So that led that kind of ruled out that option. And we didn't really have a requirement for SEO, so we were able to just leverage dynamic rendering. Another aspect that we really wanted to focus on was keeping the front end kind of dumb. Uh, we wanted all that complex logic to still happen on the server. And like I touched on with pre-rendering, we're really trying to avoid personal information uh, being duplicated or cached on other services so that we just don't have to worry about that. So what if landing pages didn't need to know about the layout or the content ahead of time? Or what if we could pass the UI and the data directly and skip requesting the PII separately? That's when we came up with the Lunar Lander platform. It's a unified, opinionated, server-driven UI system that enables us to iterate rapidly and consistently across all of our clients. The name Lunar Lander actually comes from a previously space theme uh, that we had internally. And we figured that since customers were landing on these pages, we might as well call it Lunar Lander. The core feature of Lunar Lander is that features can share a library of generic sections, components, and actions. We can even introduce backwards compatibility, enabling our client success teams to onboard faster with more interactive UIs and move, keep that move and keep that complicated business logic central on the back end. Here's an example of what 
a lunar lander response might look like. In the example on the left, we have a user view, what a customer might see when they land on that page from an outreach. So the way we actually break that up is we have a, a header uh, section, a main section, and a footer. In those areas, we can define different components, and the components actually handle how they lay out on the screen. On the right side, we have the component model that we have. So starting at the top, we have a brand definition. We actually define that external to the page layout so we can reuse it. Those are things like the branding colors, um, the logo, any of that kind of information, even intelligent fallbacks. One interesting thing about the brand definition is that we start out by only needing three colors from each client. We actually auto-generate a lot of the hover states, the interactive states on all the, the components dynamically using Emotion CSS in JS. So from that, we can then start looking at where all the other sections fall into the line. And so in main, we can actually put in a lot of that information you're seeing on screen. So the account details, a unique headline for that user, um, unique payment paragraph information that suits that user and, and their, their current circumstance. We can even put interactive components in there, such as payment reminder forms, um, other types of interactive elements where we can collect information and submit those back. So how does this look like in the API? Well, this is a good example of a basic um, structure that we actually send back and forth from the server. We can provide the language code, which is actually super important to us. We actually need that because some of our clients have legal requirements to show the content in the language that they have saved uh, in their client's CRMs. So even though the browser is requesting um, English, we may actually need to show it in French and override that. Um, we can introduce page titles just so we keep it like a normal website. Open graph previews, if we're sending it through mobile and, and it supports it, we can actually show a little preview. Then we get into the main sections and the, the footer sections. In main, we can actually, it's just an array of um, objects that actually described the content and that we're going to render. It even includes things like actions or, um, or uh, more metadata for those components to have uh, customizable interactions. So something like payment reminder form might include something like the date maximum for the maximum date in a date picker. But it also needs to tell us what the API URL is that we're going to submit that data back to the server with. The really interesting thing about how this works is the components are all really defined by their type name. So that's super important for us and we match that up to an internal set of components that we have um, on Lunar Lander. So as we get this data, we spin through them and we render them on screen. All the configuration is passed as props into those components and then used in order to enhance that experience. Now, if we get back to that payment reminder form, it has stuff like API URLs and date maxes. But when we submit it, we can actually really look at um, a dynamic flow and change the content. So in this screen, when Lucy comes in and she submits her payment date, submitting it actually does a client-side request to the backend, puts that payment reminder into the system, then actually returns a new layout to us on the front end. We'll actually use that, replace the contents with that new layout, and then have React re-render. And that's how we get dynamic pages. This also benefits from not having to do the navigation between the links, but so that if they refresh the screen, they actually get the uh, exact same screen that they were on previously. So I thought this talk was about Next.js and um, Cement. So we still leverage a lot of the aspects of uh, Next.js. So page uh, page based routing is, is what we use also. We need it in order to actually define dynamic segments that we use in our request to the API. So in this example right here, 
the page slug is actually helping us uh, request the page from the back end. And the outreach hash is used in conjunction so that we can send in more information about what outreach this was sent by, email or text message, or even uh, tell us who the customer was so we can track all of this information. Some pages are informational, but some pages are also um, stateful. So we actually have to request some data with that current user in mind. And if this, if everything goes well, we actually get a page. Now this page is actually broken into two requests. Run, one request is to get the brand, and that fills in, like I was saying before, the logo, the colors, the button styles, all of that stuff comes from the brand definition. We can use that in order to build this page in a more branded look. Then, after we have that, we can actually request the, the landing page itself. That's gonna give us all the content that needs to fill in uh, where the header goes, the account information specific to that customer, and the rest of the details. But there is a case where we may actually you know, fail. There could be timeouts, there could be um, a network request, a uh, network failure. In those cases, we still have to keep up that illusion that the client is in charge of all of these pages. And to do that, we, this two-prong approach is super valuable. If we request the brand, but we can't get the page, we can actually show a branded version of the failure page with more information on either trying again or um, a link to their, their site so that they can self-serve themselves there. In the event that any of this really fails, we can go and fall back to an unbranded kind of just generic uh, error page so that we don't have to feel that uh, there's you know stack traces or anything like that. So we're just trying to keep up that illusion. Now, you're probably wondering, we have all of these different styles of page and they're all dynamic and all that. How's performance? Well, one thing that's nice is when we went to uh, profile this with Lighthouse, we actually still kept up quite a high performance and accessibility numbers. Those numbers were really important to us. And we really focused on the fact that accessibility was supposed to be paramount. So a lot of the components that are used take into uh, account semantic HTML, proper um, accessibility rules just to provide the best experience for everyone. So now that you've done all this, what are the results? Well, we had a reduction in new client onboarding costs of 85%. A lot of that cost savings came from less engineering involvement and the reduction in time to get it uh, to get a new client spun up. We went from t roughly about two weeks down to less than two days. And now any of those updates can be made on the fly and it's served right out to customers. In addition, we moved to one serverless function to complete all of our clients' uh, landing page needs. So previously we actually had one VM per client in order to serve the, the uh, landing sites. So now we're able to do it with one serverless function. So it was a great way to reduce that surface area and uh, risk across the platform. So what are the next steps now that you've done this? So we definitely had to take some shortcuts and some, cut some corners when we had to build this out. So some of the future initiatives were investigating caching techniques at the API layer that still, you know, take into account that PII um, it layer or PII amount of data that we really just don't want to expose and leave on other servers. We definitely always want to introduce additional configurable components and layouts, and that's just to keep allow um, our clients to continue to create really bespoke content for them that really just makes everyone seem a little bit different rather than everyone looking cookie cutter. Um, another aspect that we, we really want to improve on is the building experience of content and workflow rules. So right now, the, 
we ended up defining them all in JSON structures so that we could really um, get to market faster. But as we go forward, on a more WYSIWYG drag and drop builder is definitely on the roadmap so that we can have a better experience. And lastly, we're always about looking for performance optimizations, accessibility um, upgrades, and just making the overall user experience better. So one of those areas that Next is really gonna help us with is using their dynamic imports. We're hoping that we can actually use it to further our um, dynamic bundle uh, imports so that we can really um, simplify some of the, the loading and really reduce that response time. And that's everything for me. So thank you for attending this. Um, I'm Eric Chanuka. You can find me on Twitter at Eric Chanuka, all one word. And thanks again.